on behalf of the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies and the Labor Solidarity Project at the University of Washington Tacoma, I want to welcome everyone to really the first installment of this fall seminar series, which we're calling Labor Strikes Back. Uh, when we decided on that title, we were hoping to capture uh, what I think is the energy and the potential of the moment uh, to emphasize that, you know, the power and the understanding that comes from when we stop sort of thinking individually and start working together. And I think as pretty much everybody on this call could agree, you know, COVID brought a number of inequities into sharp relief. Um, it also revealed, you know, just the, the limitations of a system of governance that often seems just kind of like constitutionally incapable of prioritizing anything over profit. And I think, you know, over the last two years, as these institutions repeatedly failed American workers, you know, we came to see, I know, uh, in, in my case, I came to see that that really all we had was was each other. Um, so consequently, I like to think, you know, as we kick off this academic year and kick off this new seminar series, um, I like to think that we're coming out of COVID, you know, to the extent that we're coming out of COVID, we need to bear that in mind. Um, but we're coming out with a renewed sense of, of urgency, uh, identity as American workers, and hopefully uh, solidarity, right? I think the, you know, the, the proverbial iron is hot and it is time for, uh, you know, labor to strike back. You know, if not now, when, right? Um, however, having said all that, you know, striking back, requires challenging a system that that often feels like it was it was actually designed to create and reproduce inequality um it, it you know it makes you think you know are today's political and economic realities are these are these symptoms of a failed system or are things actually operating exactly according to the vision of our founding fathers um, and this is the question that our guest tonight pursues uh, in his latest book, We the Elites, Why the U.S. Constitution Serves the Few, which I believe was published, was it published this month, Robert? Last month? Excellent. Congratulations. So hot off the press. So uh, please join me in extending a warm digital welpen. welcome to Robert Ovitz, who's a senior lecturer in political science, also teaches labor relations in the Masters of Public Administration program at San Jose State University. Uh, in addition to uh, We the Elites, he's also the editor of a fantastic collected volume, uh, Workers' Inquiry and Global Class Struggle, Strategies, Tactics, Objectives. Uh, that, that was also published by Pluto Press um, and the author of When Workers Shot Back, Class Conflict from 1877 to 1921, one of my favorite periods in American labor mm -hmm. history. I should add. Um, in addition to publishing all of those books, he writes about worker organizing for Dollars and Cents magazine uh, and the chief and is the uh, book review editor at the Journal of Labor and Society. So uh, join me again in thanking Robert for uh, joining us this evening, being part of the seminar. I'm really excited to hear more about your work and just, you know, as always excited to provide a platform for work that I think, uh, you know, everybody should be reading. Thanks, Alex. Such great, great welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to uh, be able to uh, join this discussion and be part of this <clears throat> really impressive um, series. I, I think it, I agree with you. It's, it's far past time for labor to strike back. And certainly we're seeing a lot of that happening all around the country. Uh, and in different parts of the world, after all, because we do have a global economic system. Um, so it, it's good to see that. And it's something that I write about quite regularly in, in Dollars and Cents and The Chief. And you can find those, those pieces online as well. So I'm going to talk for uh, maybe a half hour or so. And then uh, I, I invite you to post any questions that you have in the chat. And then when we're done, we'll take a look at uh, what kind of comments and questions have been posted. And I'll be happy to spend time answering them and having a conversation with everyone. But like you were saying, Alex, you know, it's really important to really look back at the origin of our system and to really understand what role does the Constitution play in our ability to organize and addressing the big problems that we face. And these big problems are not new. Although it seems like we have some new ones just emerging virtually every day or week in our country. What are these big problems? I think we can all agree on these problems across the political spectrum. We face a catastrophic climate, climate disaster 
uh, that threatens uh, most uh, biological life on this planet. Uh, it's getting worse uh, by the day, by the week. I, I'm speaking from uh, north of the San Francisco Bay Area, where fire season is now 12 years, uh, 12 months a year. Um, and I live in a semi-rural area, and at any moment, uh, we might have to flee and, and see our home burned. Um, and that's just, that's just a small part of it. Um, we also are seeing just continuing rapid wealth inequality. And Alex, you were talking about during the pandemic. Well, during the pandemic, uh, the rich got richer and the rest of us stood still. Um, wealth inequality is at astronomically high levels and it just continues to grow with every annual report that gets put out uh, by groups in, in a Swiss bank that actually track it. The housing crisis is just extraordinary. It's not just across California, but across the country and the world. Uh, housing prices are astronomically high to buy and to rent. Um, in fact, uh, every semester, um, I have my intro to political science students talk about something they would put on the ballot as a drug democracy measure, and housing is the issue for a third to half of them. Um, and I'm speaking from teaching in the Silicon Valley, one of the most expensive housing markets in the country. Then we have corporate power, corporations just growing out of control. I mean, we just heard about what Amazon tried to do by forcing these workers back into a warehouse at JFK 8 on Long Island, the first unionized uh, warehouse, they tried to force them back hours after the warehouse had caught fire. Uh, corporations uh, evade almost any accountability or responsibility to their workers, to society, and they are incredibly powerful and influential throughout our political system, from the local all the way to the uh, national and global level. We have oppressive labor law that makes it virtually impossible to organize a union as the Amazon Labor United uh, learned. Um, and then once they overcame that, makes it virtually impossible to force an employer to agree to a contract. And I'm gonna talk more about uh, the impact on conditions of organizing uh, right now. We also saw Roe v. Wade overturned uh, by an activist uh, right-wing dominated Supreme Court, taking away what uh, for almost 50 years, uh, the Supreme Court has has found to be a fundamental right of women, um, of privacy and equal protection and due process. Um, and we've had endless war um, at any time uh, since World War II. We've had dozens of active military operations going on. We have 100 military bases and, and facilities around the world. Um, and we are now looking like we're finally ending over two decades of endless war on terrorism if we started um, on 9-11-2001. And that's led to mass surveillance and torture and assassination of American citizens. The problems are extraordinary. They're broad, uh, they're deep, and they go virtually unaddressed. Why is that? Why do these problems continue? Despite the fact that uh, polls show that super majorities of Americans uh, support action on all of these issues and others, including improving our education system or making higher education free, that would be great. Uh, very little happens that actually serves the interests and needs of the majority. Well, why is that? Why does our system seem incapable of functioning? The answers that we often are, are uh, provided is partisanship. The parties just don't get along, or we have corrupt politicians, and certainly both of those are are true, they, they exist. Um, and we hear also about the lack of, of participation of the American population. People just don't vote, people don't get involved. So it's a kind of blame the victim approach uh, or blame the personalities. But one thing we never really hear about is how these problems are really rooted, not in the contemporary problems, but they're actually rooted in the fundamental rules of our political system, of our governance system. That is the constitution. That's the fundamental body of rules of how our system works. Almost nobody talks about how the constitution causes these problems, how the constitution is really the cause of how we got a president like Trump, who then tried to carry out a self-coup, uh, a seditious self-coup to keep himself in power potentially for the rest of his life, how many years he's got left. Now, why is that? Why, why is the constitution potentially the cause of many of these problems. This is what my book's about. So I'm gonna talk for a little bit about how we can understand that and why it's relevant 
uh, for our efforts at, at organizing uh, ourselves as workers. Well, the problem of the Constitution is rooted in that the Constitution was designed by 55 white wealthy men. Virtually all of them were affluent. Some of them were the wealthiest in the country. Perhaps a third of them uh, owned slaves or profited directly from slavery. Um, and many of the rest uh, were merchants, they were traders, bankers, investors, and, uh, and many of them held differing levels of, of government debt that hadn't been repaid. And I'm going to talk more about that. So all of these interests essentially brought them together in Philadelphia in that hot summer of 1787, where they hammered out essentially a class agreement. They crossed their different uh, differing interests as members of the elite uh, led, literally governed by perhaps the wealthiest man in the country at the time, George Washington, who presided over the Constitutional Convention. And they essentially designed a system uh, filled with an array um, of minority checks, what I call minority checks. And as a political science and, uh, lecturer, um, I teach about how we call this checks and balances. You probably heard this in elementary school and middle school when you studied civics. These checks and balances essentially operate as minority checks. These minority checks give those who oppose change uh, the ability to block any change that might threaten the interests of the property elites. And these minority checks effectively do this by constraining political democracy and preventing economic democracy. So just to be clear, these checks are also in place to make sure that our system doesn't devolve into a dictatorship or return to a monarchy. That was part of the intended design of the framers, but they also made it very clear that they didn't want a democratic system and they didn't design a democratic system. And they did that intentionally. They did that intentionally because what was happening at the time threatened the interests of the ruling elite. So what does this have to do with labor issues? What does it have to do with the situation that we face today? Well, before I get into the details of how the constitution was designed, I think we should take this pause for a moment and think about what are the problems that we face today as labor attempts to strike back, as, as Alex put it. Um, I think we face a whole range of different issues that we can trace back to the design of the constitution. For example, wages, while they've risen a little over 5% in the past year, far below the rate of inflation, so it's actually a wage decline across the board, um, wages are still too low. They virtually have not risen at all for over four decades, more than my entire lifespan. We work far too much. Our hours are too long. Uh, we're producing ever more. Productivity has skyrocketed while wages have been stagnant. Um, and many of us are working multiple jobs. Um, I myself teach in two places. Uh, in addition to San Jose State University, I also teach part-time at a community college. Uh, and so across the board, from those with few skills and little job experience, all the way to lawyers, uh, people are underpaid, working too much, and sometimes having to work multiple jobs. Our unions are incredibly weak. What we call union density has dropped dramatically from about 30% when I was born, to just about uh, eight to 10%, depending on whether you're looking at the public sector or the private sector. Corporations have incredible power also to prevent workers from organizing. And then even if they organize and they're legally recognized under the National Labor Relations Board or under, uh, if they're a public sector, um, it's still possible for an employer to just not ever conclude a contract and just wait it out. Um, and to sabotage bargaining. Um, and then also to take collective action, even though concerted or collective action is legal under the National Labor Relations Act, the federal law, it's virtually impossible to do it without suffering the possibilities of retaliation, even though retaliation is illegal. Um, we see this happening with, I think, five dozen Starbucks workers. And while these workers have organized 234 by last count Starbucks, there are over 16,000 Starbucks around the world, 12,000 of them in the United States. And Starbucks has had no problem just firing people 
they're willing to pay the fine, pay the back wages. Um, but it's virtually impossible to organize using the rules of the system. Labor law essentially is rigged against workers. And it's almost impossible for uh, any reform of labor law to pass. There have been efforts going back to when Jimmy Carter was president, when I was in elementary school. Not a single labor law reform has passed Congress. We can also look at how legislation that serves the working class, that serves workers or the general public, because after all, the supermajority of our population are essentially members of the working class. They're paid for their labor. Um, I recently wrote a piece for the chief, and I'll have another piece analyzing this in dollars and cents about the Inflation Reduction Act. That bill was widely celebrated when President Biden signed it this summer, a rare piece of legislation that passed Congress. Um, however, it doesn't look anything like the origin of that bill, which was known as the Green New Deal, which was an attempt essentially to rewire and restructure our economy to get us off of fossil fuels before the planet becomes toast. Uh, that became the Build Back Better bill, a $2 trillion bill that Biden couldn't get through the Senate because two of his own party members were blocking it. And after shifting it away from getting us off fossil fuels to actually subsidizing polluters with tens of billions of dollars of subsidies um, and a few other things that are beneficial in the short term, the bill was finally able to pass. So what became the Inflation Reduction Act doesn't look anything like the original piece of legislation. Why is that? Because throughout our system of government, there are minority checks that are scattered across the system that allow those who are opposed to change to block that change unless they get the changes that they want. And essentially what in political science we call the sausage making process of how a bill becomes a law is really not about sausage because by the end, often these bills are not even edible. Um, and as a vegetarian, I'm speaking very, very broadly here. Um, we can include vegetarian sausage too. Um, so the labor movement is incredibly weak and the possibilities of labor reform or passing legislation that serves the working class, which essentially serves the supermajority's interests, is virtually impossible these days unless we open up a bill and give away essentially the intention of the legislation to those who have no interest in having it pass. So why is our system functioning like this? Why is it that um, what the majority wants at the beginning of the process either never passes or it gets transformed into something that's almost diametrically opposed to what the majority wants? Why is it that the majority, for example, says we want super majority, 70, 80%, virtually every poll for decades say we want better public education. And what we end up getting is privatization. We get public money channeled to mostly corrupt charter schools that are run by uh, private individuals who are engaged in paying themselves huge salaries or for-profit companies that make money off of children's education. We don't get better education. Why is that? So let's let's go back to the 1780s and go back to the time when the Constitution was written. At this time, when the framers met in Philadelphia, they were faced with essentially three types of insurrections. And those three insurrections is what drove them to Philadelphia. But before they got to Philadelphia, there were actually several other meetings that were attempts to try to create a, a new system, a new agreement, starting first an agreement with trade um, between the states, which were all independent countries at the time that uh, worked together and cooperated in what was called the Confederation, run by our first constitution, the Articles of Confederation. So elites from several states got together and held several meetings. One of them was hosted at Mount Vernon, Washington slave plantation, and they didn't get enough people there. And then there was a meeting in Delaware, not enough people showed up. So they went to the Congress and they of the Confederation and they asked for permission to have a meeting to come up to discuss and come up with ideas for fixing the Articles of Confederation. And I'll talk about what those issues were in a few minutes. And they finally got approval and they ended up in Philadelphia. So when their when their convention starts, they're facing three insurrections. They've been facing them nonstop, even through the American Revolution. Those three insurrections came from first, 
native peoples who were organized and armed, and they were resisting genocidal colonialization of their lands. They were fighting back. And many times they were winning and many times they were losing, but they were fighting and they were blocking westward, westward colonial expansion. Um, these native peoples were armed because many of them had aligned with the British during the French Indian Wars. You could call it the French British uh, global war um, that included Native Americans. And so they were armed. Uh, there was an attempt to create a continent-wide confederation of different tribes, and they were forming essentially a united front, and they were still powerful. The second insurrection that the elites faced at the time, and I should say the first one prevented them from getting access to more land. The second one came from slaves. During the American Revolution, remember, the British famously offered freedom to any slave that took up arms against the colonists. And perhaps 30 to 40 percent of slaves uh, engaged in some, on one or the other side of the revolution. But the majority of them, we know, went over to the British side. When the revolution ends, the ones who fought with the revolutionaries went back into slavery and stayed in slavery, I should say. Those who went over to the British, they the British lived up to their promise and they transported them to Canada. And many of them ended up in Liberia, what's today Liberia. They were returned to Africa. Um, but it didn't stop the slaves from organizing, running away, carrying out arson, attacks and poisoning and so forth. So slavery was not a stable system. It was constantly being threatened by the slaves themselves. There were also a number of people who were opposed to slavery, but that was very small at this point. It won't really come for a few more decades that an anti-slavery movement among whites will grow. The third insurrection they faced was from the majority of the white population. It was organized, small subsistence farmers, primarily farmers who operated outside the cash economy. They lived away from the towns. They didn't trade their, they didn't sell or trade their food with the towns. They didn't produce for export. They produced for subsistence. And doing so, they essentially bartered and traded. They didn't have a lot of cash and they didn't really need it. Land was cheap. If they could get it, uh, they could grow their own food um, and they traded and used a little bit of cash if they didn't have enough to trade. Those folks got organized. And in some states, like in Pennsylvania, uh, they actually formed uh, political parties and, um, and they organized themselves across counties and they would submit petitions to the state governments. Um, they would even uh, run for office and, and support their allies getting into office, and they would pass legislation that was friendly to uh, the working class interests. They were uh, to serve uh, laborers and small farmers. And on, on other occasions, and it happened quite regularly, uh, these farmers would organize and arm themselves and carry out direct action uh, against local elites and, uh, and state legislatures. Um, it happened in a number of states in the years leading up to the Constitutional Convention. And it would continue even in the early years of our, of our system. So these three insurrections really, really were at the forefront of the concern of the framers and many of them spoke to that. And the one insurrection that really stood out um, in, uh, in vivid detail for them was a rebellion that had happened in Massachusetts during the winter of 1786 and carried on until the beginning of 1787. And that, that we call the Shays Rebellion. It was really at the time called the Regulators Rebellion. Regulators essentially were, uh, was a, a mass movement of people who thought that they should control government and not have government control them. Thus the word regulator, they were gonna regulate government. So the, uh, the rebels in Massachusetts were pretty much all revolutionary war veterans. They hadn't been paid for their time fighting in uh, the army or the state militias. And uh, they came home from the revolution um, to find that now the state of Massachusetts, the elites there had control of the state legislature and they had passed these onerous taxes that required that they pay the taxes uh, in cold, hard cash, which was short, in short supply. There wasn't a lot of gold and silver in circulation. And um, in Massachusetts, the elites didn't like paper money, so they couldn't pay their debts in paper money. They hadn't been paid, um, and many states were deeply in debt, 
many debts had not been paid. So these folks went home, they put on their uniform, they picked up their muskets, and under the leadership of Captain Daniel Shays and two others, they marched on local courthouses to block uh, the foreclosures of farms of debtors who couldn't come up with the cash to pay those debts. And they shut down several courthouses. And uh, they were marching on an armory to seize a cache of weapons to distribute them. When the governor and fellow elites had financed a mercenary army who confronted the, the regulators, and in a very short battle, the regulators were defeated militarily, but they then split up into small hit and run guerrilla bands, and they carried out hit and run attacks uh, over the next year or so throughout New England. So this is the context when the framers, all members of the elites, uh, meet in Philadelphia when 55 finally show up and they can start that meeting. Um, there were more even that, um, that never showed up. They were picked, selected to show up, but they never arrived. When they show up, they're facing now the everyday people. They're facing the working class that have asserted political power in several states and gotten very favorable legislation for debtors, debt forgiveness, price controls, uh, paper money that could be used to pay debts, even if that money was borrowed in, in gold and silver. They also saw how willing they were to organize themselves. And many of them were trained. They had fought in the revolution. They knew how to fight. And so when they get there, they almost immediately throw out the Articles of Confederation within two days. It's in the trash. And they write an entire new constitution. And what they ended up doing was writing a, a constitution that would design a system that would prevent these kind of folks, what they called the many, or the people out of doors, the people who got their hands dirty, working in the fields, working in the sun, um, those sort of people, they called them, or the meaner sort, the rabble, the tyranny of the majority. These were all terms that were used by the framers. When you look at the, the limited records that we have from the debates at the convention, their letters, their diaries, their notes, uh, the debates at the state ratifying convention, uh, those folks who supported the constitution, who called themselves federalists, they use these kinds of terms constantly. So they look down on the everyday people, the supermajority of the population. And what they ended up designing was a constitutional system that looked a lot more like ancient Rome, where the Senate was run by the landed elites, and most of the population had no real role in that system at all outside the tribunes um, where, but the Senate had the final say and formed the executive branch, the proconsuls. They preferred that system where the elites ruled, where they had checks on the everyday people rather than ancient Athens, where the everyday free males all formed the assembly and they took turns and they formed the courts and they voted on everything in ancient Athens. So. The framers designed a system that would be ruled by the elites and would lock out the everyday people from having any say. So when we grow up in the United States, we learn from the earliest age, whether you watch Schoolhouse Rock or you see it in a movie, that America is a democracy and that it's always been a democracy and that the framers were the inventors of our democracy. But the reality is when you look at the historical record, as I've done for a number of years, reading through all of these firsthand accounts of this time period, um, I find that um, virtually every one of the framers had no intention of creating a democracy. And what they created was a system uh, that grew out of their fear of the working class rather than their empowerment of the working class. So they feared the working class because uh, they had seen these three insurrections and particularly the small farmers, they saw them as uh, a threat to property. And they were pretty explicit about that. Um, and because they were concerned about property and they wanted to create a system that protected it better than the state governments that had nearly all the power and the weak central Congress under the Articles of Confederation, um, they had to keep the everyday people, off, keep their hands off the reins of government. So they designed a system in which the property elites essentially had control over the system. But knowing that someday the system might be changed, tweaked a little bit, reformed, 
They also designed a system that was incredibly complex and filled with these minority checks that would make it difficult, if not impossible, to bring about change that might threaten minority interests. And here I'm talking about minority interests as class interests. So the minority of elites versus the majority of essentially the working class, the diverse working class we have today, and that we had at a lesser degree at the time. So how do we know that the framers were concerned about protecting property? Well, in Federalist Number 10, probably the classic and most, most widely cited of the Federalist Papers, these were a series of editorials uh, that were uh, written by those who supported ratification of the Constitution. Uh, this uh, Federalist Paper Number 10 was written by James Madison. And James Madison is the primary source of information we have about the debates at the Constitutional Convention. Although everyone was pledged to secrecy, some people actually did take notes, Madison being the most comprehensive. Some of the people who were opposed to the Constitution left midway through and then made their notes public. But Madison kept his notes secret until the end of his life, and he revised them to kind of clean up his image, and then they were published after he died. And he was the last surviving framer. And so there was nobody around anymore to critique and challenge his version of things. So we have to take that into account. But in the publicly published Federalist Papers, which were uh, arguments for ratification of the Constitution, there were also people who were opposed to the ratification that were called anti-Federalists. Madison said, such democracies as Athens have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have been, in short, in their lives that they've been violent in their deaths. So Madison speaks very directly here that democracies are a threat to property. They're turbulent, they're violent, and they don't live very long. Hamilton joined him as well. Hamilton, who was the designer of our financial system, um, which is really the model for a global capitalist financial system. Uh, Hamilton, when he became Secretary of the Treasury, Hamilton denounced democracy as, he said, amazing violence and turbulence. Now, Hamilton is uh, portrayed in a very positive light in that amazing play. I, I love that play. I've seen it twice. I listened to the outtakes of the uh, remix album, um, I love the sounds, uh, I love the lighting and the sets and the dance and the music, but the story is almost inaccurate. Uh, Hamilton was no friend of the people. Um, in fact, he helped, uh, he helped, tried to help by proposing in an eight hour long speech, uh, designing uh, a system that was widely rejected by his uh, fellow um, framers, uh, because it was so extraordinarily pro-British. He wanted to have an elected king, and they knew that if this was in the Constitution, it wouldn't be ratified at the state conventions. Now, in Federalist 21, um, Hamilton, also one of the three co-authors of the Federalist Papers, um, spoke specifically to the Shays Rebellion, and he saw it as a potential example where uh, he said, a successful faction may erect a tyranny on the ruins of law and order. So they spoke very widely um, and, and very openly about how democracy was not only distasteful, but they saw it as a tyranny of the majority. Even John Adams, who was still in England at this point, he wasn't uh, at the Constitutional Convention, but he wrote a very influential book about republics that many of the framers had read or knew about. Uh, he warned uh, a few years earlier about democracies. He says democracies waste wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. And he even felt terror, he said, uh, when he thought of elections, which were, quote unquote, productive of horrors. So these founding fathers, who I call the framers of the Constitution, they were no fan of democracy. So because they weren't big fans of the everyday people having their hands on the levers of power, um, they ended up not designing a system that we think we the people means. So the first three words in the preamble, we the people, today we think of it as literally everybody. Um, but for them at the time, we the people meant propertied white men. And when I say propertied, 
you have to have a certain amount of property to be able to vote and run for office. Now, that's not in the Constitution, but what's in Article One is that um, the rules of the states for elections would um, be would be accepted. Now, Congress can uh, set the times and order of elections, but it's the states that make the rules. And so for the first few decades of our country's history, very few people voted. It was in the thousands, several singles of thousands of people were eligible to vote. And that's because they didn't have enough property in their state to be able to vote. Now, states started to lower that uh, requirement. In some states, it was much lower because of the influence of the subsistence farmers. But all of that gets wiped away in the early 1800s when there's actually a white male suffrage movement, the first real reform movement that grows out of the Democratic Republican clubs that helps get Jefferson elected. And one of their big grievances was we're white and male. We own property, but we don't have enough to run for office or to vote. So the framers didn't design a system to let the common person rule, but to prevent the common person from ruling. Uh, George Washington also spoke to this. Um, he wanted to crush the Shays Rebellion and any other type of insurgency like that, uh, because he said, mankind left to themselves are unfit for their own government. <laughs> this is from the founding father of our country. He felt that if the debtor's revolt wasn't immediately repressed, quote, the combustibles in every state which may set fire, uh, which a spark may set fire to, unquote, would essentially lead to this kind of tyranny of the democracy. So what they designed was a system with many minority checks that give the advantage to those who are opposed to change in order to protect property. And if we look at how a bill becomes a law, how the Green New Deal became the Inflation Reduction Act, it turned out that way because all through our system in the legislative process, there are numerable, literally dozens of places where those who are opposed to change only need to win once to block that bill from ever passing. Whereas those who support change need to win every time. And in order to win every time, you've got to compromise. And so we hear this word compromise a lot, that the lack of compromise is why things don't happen. But in fact, I would argue the opposite, that the overuse of, of compromise, which is required to get anything done in our system, is actually the reason why things don't get done or why they get done in a way that doesn't actually address the problem. Um, in order to overcome those roadblocks and impediments, it's necessary to give up something. And by the time you get through those dozens and dozens of roadblocks and impediments, you've given up essentially the original intention of what you're trying to achieve. For example, um, even if you manage to pass your bill through every committee of both House of Congress, both houses of Congress, um, and it goes to the president, the president can still veto it. Even if the president signs it, and if they veto it, you have to override that veto. Not easy to do. Even if the president signs it, it can still be held as unconstitutional in our federal court system based on the power of judicial review, which doesn't even exist in the Constitution. It was made up by Chief Justice John Marshall and previous Supreme Court justices before him in the early years of our system. Um, and even if the Supreme Court upholds it, states can still refuse to implement it or sue again or Congress can not fund it. So there are many opportunities to block change from happening. Um, so these roadblocks and impediments essentially impede political democracy and prevent economic democracy. And they were designed into the system in response to the threats of demands for political democracy and economic democracy, particularly to protect property. And what was the most valuable form of property at that time? We haven't talked about it yet, but it was slaves. Human beings held as property were the most valuable form of property in the country at the time. There were, that was the foundation of our economic system. That was the basis of our system all the way until the Civil War, until the 13th Amendment ended it, except for prisoners. And even the, the crops grown by slaves would be our number one export until World War I, cotton particularly. So the slave system was really at the center of their focus. How do we prevent the majority from abolishing slavery? And we know it took a civil war to essentially abolish slavery. It could not be done through this, the rules of the system. Um, and that's a lesson for another day. So um, why, 
Why design the system so in such a complicated way? So these innumerable minority checks, Madison and Hamilton both described as a form of divide and conquer. They used the Latin term divide and imperia, uh, but Madison called uh, divide and conquer the probated axiom of tyranny is under certain qualifications, the only policy by which a republic can be administered on just principles. So for Madison and Hamilton, they were pretty explicit in several of the Federalist Papers. Uh, Madison in Federalist 43 talked about breaking up essentially the majority into so many interests, he said, and parties that a common sentiment is less likely to be felt and the requisite concert less likely to be formed by a majority of the whole. So the system was designed to be incredibly complicated on purpose, to slow down and prevent change from happening. And now that we face this myriad of existential crises to the very survival of humanity, it turns out that our constitution is what's blocking the way to change, essentially getting rid of fossil fuels, most critically, um, and stopping the uh, emissions of methane and other carbon uh, gases that um, car uh, climate destroying gases that are making humanity's uh, life incredibly short on our planet. So we need to think about how do we address this? How do we address this problem? If the rules of the system themselves are designed to make change impossible, if not slow it down and uh, allow those who are opposed to change to rewrite it so it serves their interests, what do we do about it? So there's essentially three options as I see it. And this is how I conclude my book is exploring these options. The first one is we can try to amend the constitution. Well, that sounds good. Let's try to fix it. Let's try to fix the system. And in fact, there have been 27 amendments added to the constitution. But that's 27 amendments in now 234 years of our system being in operation since the Constitution was ratified. Out of about 10,000 proposed amendments that have been introduced into Congress, that's a very low success rate. And part of the reason is the Constitution was designed to make it virtually unchangeable. Article 5 lays out the process for amending the Constitution and sets it at two thirds of both houses of Congress and three quarters of the states or two thirds of the states propose a constitutional amendment or a new constitutional convention and three quarters of the states have to ratify it. That's only been achieved 27 times. That's a success rate of 0.0027%, or in other words, to put it simply, a quarter of 1% of all proposed, officially proposed amendments have been ratified. That's not gonna happen anytime soon. Um, and some parts of the Constitution even prevent anything from being changed by amendment. The Article 5 even says that no state shall be de denied um, equal votes in the Senate. In other words, we can't fix the problem of the Senate, which is the place where most bills go to die. So amendments are difficult. Um, I encourage my students to think about how we might amend the Constitution, but the processing is incredibly difficult. In fact, women you still don't have rights in our constitution because the Equal Rights Amendment was never ratified before the clock ran out. Um, so we'd have to probably start all over again to do that. That's an unlikely uh, scenario considering uh, the political divides of today between the two dominant parties of our uh, two-party system. So the next possible option is to hold a new constitutional convention. Well, uh, to do that, we need to also get two thirds of the states or Congress, uh, both houses of Congress and three quarters of the states to ratify um, a resolution, uh, uh, a new, uh, the, the new constitution that's written by a constitutional convention. That's also incredibly difficult. In fact, there's an effort right now that's underway to call for a constitutional convention. Um, resolutions have been passed by, I think about a dozen states so far. The problem with that though, is it's entirely funded by a family of far right billionaire fossil fuel industry uh, 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 activists called the Koch brothers. You may have heard of them. There's only one living Koch brother left now, but they've put big money into this. And what that means is they've got a head start. And if we actually have a constitutional convention, you can guarantee that the elites are going to pour billions of dollars 
into helping write the constitution to serve their interests. And things may actually get worse off if it's ratified, because certainly they'll spend billions to be able to convince people to vote for their constitution. You know, the people of Chile just voted down an impressive new constitution to replace the one written by a dictator who left office four decades ago. Big interest poured lots of money into convincing the population to vote against the constitution that serves their interests. There's nothing that would prevent that from happening here as well. So a constitutional convention, we need one, but it might turn out to have a worse outcome. And we wouldn't want to, we wouldn't want to do that. So what I suggest, my last option in closing, is that we just forget about our constitution and follow the lead of the framers, the founding fathers, who said, forget the articles. It can't, they can't be fixed because they needed consensus to amend. The articles. They needed uh, Congress to have uh, 13 out of 13 states approve amendments, and then all the states had to approve amendments. And not a single amendment out of five attempts, I think it was, uh, were ever ratified um, in the short period of time that the articles were in effect, about, about uh, eight years or so. Um, so let's follow the lead of the framers, and let's design a new system from the bottom up. We can create many constitutions at the local or regional levels by holding open assemblies and talking and debating about what kind of system would we like to have? And not just the political system, but what kind of economic system would we like to have? Because the current economic system is really the source of why humanity's days could be numbered on this planet. We need a new economic system. Um, if we're not going to look up, we need to look down and design a new system that is hyper-democratic where we together make decisions about how we run our economic system. And by doing that, we, uh, by default, are creating a new system of self-governance. And so as we move into a period when labor is striking back, this gives us the greatest opportunity during, say, a period of a general strike or a mass strike uh, for us to democratize our economic system and decide how we produce the goods and services that we need and that many of us are lacking. And when we decide how to run our economy, we're essentially deciding how to govern ourselves. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, and um, I look forward to, to having a conversation. And I hope that folks will have an opportunity to read um, some of my book if you haven't already. Um, and, um, and I don't know if there's uh, questions yet in the chat because I had it closed, um, but I, I would love to, to hear if there's any questions um, Alex, you'd like to bring forward or um, um, or if anybody um, has any that they would like to to add to the the chat if they haven't already. Excellent. Well, before we do that, let's uh, let's all just join me in giving uh, Robert Ovetz a, a round of applause. Thank you so much again for zooming in and sharing this work, um, which, yeah, is, you know, absolutely love the book it was a great sort of teaser for what you've got to say in the book itself which is absolutely fantastic um, and again just a really important prehistory um you know you can't you can't know where we are without knowing where we've been um you know and i think as you alluded to i think uh you know the the average american tends to think about sort of the you know the system as as providing guardrails to prevent against dysfunction and inequality when in fact um you know it, it seems like looking historically the, the progress we have managed to achieve has often been uh in spite of the system right um i think yeah that 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 idea of sort of we the people that pronoun is doing a lot of work in that opening clause right and that's uh you know um you know it that, that, that's a very small club and we're not in it, right? And I think, as you mentioned in the in the presentation, you know, we've got we've got the receipts from the founders themselves talking about democracy and you know actively sort of pushing back against it. So I think, uh, you know, when we look at today's political problems, um, I think you're right to to identify the fact that it's you know it's not it's not the gridlock of the swamp, right? It's it's like, uh, in fact, like, regardless of what side of the aisle, many of those people sit on, they're actually unified in terms of preventing any real change, right? They are, you know, uh, progressive or conservative, they are kind of all inherently conservative. So um, 
So I want to uh, hand it over to the audience for questions. And I've got, uh, I, I, I managed to save some of the questions that were submitted ahead of time. So if you're, if you're in the audience right now, if a question has uh, dawned upon you during this presentation, go ahead and type that into the chat. Um, while we wait for the questions to roll in, I can circle back to um, some of the ones that were submitted ahead of time. There was one I really liked um, about uh, something you say in your book about uh, you know Congress being designed to be inefficient when it when it serves the interests of the economic majority, uh, but but it can be really efficient when it serves the interests of the elite. Um, and so it's kind of. Uh, this question that came in was interested in kind of clarifying that distinction you're making and then kind of looking at something like, um, you know, the COVID-19 relief acts as an example of like, you know, oh, like apparently it can function efficiently at times, right? Can you speak yeah. more to that? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I, I think the COVID relief act is a great example. And there were there were several of them in, in Congress very quickly under President Trump, spent trillions of dollars. Um, and what's really fascinating about them is that uh, we saw on a temporary basis a number of reforms that we've been unsuccessful at getting for decades. Uh, one of them is paid parental leave, paid sick leave. There is parental leave under federal law going back to the 90s, but there it's not paid. Uh, some states have it. California has it. We just expanded it. Uh, but we got that. We got expanded unemployment. Uh, maybe some of you were able to get unemployment or you have family members who were gig workers who drove for Uber or Lyft or delivered for DoorDash or something like that. They were able to get unemployment. And so we saw a massive expansion of the social welfare state, so to speak. Uh, what we also saw was that at the same time, one reason that those bills passed so quickly was that even more money was spent subsidizing businesses so that they kept their employees on their payroll. In other words, that they kept them working. And it's interesting that, you know, we often hear that our system just by providing a fragmented, broken social welfare system of food stamps and Section 8 and so forth, or it's now called uh, SNAP, um, and few other benefits that only a, por a small portion of people with need can actually qualify for. In just a matter of weeks, under President Trump, who signed these bills that they passed, and I think the main reason why they passed so quickly was that what we call Keynesian fiscal policy was recognized as a way to keep capitalism afloat. It kept businesses operating. It kept it put money into people's hands, so we kept spending it and kept the economic system going. And it demonstrates something that a lot of those who were opposed to government spending uh, were willing to accept in a time of crisis is a form of state, what I call state capitalism of, uh, or what others might call democratic socialism where the state actually employs people. And so like you were saying, Alex, very quickly, we see Congress act when it serves the interests of the property elites, keep the economy afloat. But we see very slow action or, or no action at all when it serves our interests. Uh, you know, we can go back to the New Deal period. You know, the New Deal is often widely celebrated as one of those periods where change happened despite the design of our system. And there were some really good changes. You know, workers got rights to form unions for the first time. Uh, Social Security was created. But those, those bills passed very quickly because capitalism was in crisis and because there was a mass insurrection of workers who were striking in the middle of the depression and the growth of a communist movement. And that movement was blocking evictions. People were losing their homes. You also had farmers that were organizing. Um, and in order to keep capitalism from going under and following in the way of other revolutions of previous decades, like the Russian Revolution, um, the Democrats, the uh, led by President Roosevelt, passed these bills very quickly. And many, many big changes over the period of just about three to four years. So change can happen. And often when change happens quickly and there's nobody in the streets or nobody on strike, then we should also be very cautious about who those changes benefit. But when people are in the streets, 
uh, when we become ungovernable, when the system goes into crisis because of our organizing and our disruptive action, then that's when change moves the quickest. But we also have to be careful about that because it's often a version of what is being demanded from the streets and from the shop floor. Um, and it's a compromise. And those who are opposed to change are willing to accept some version of what they don't want in order to restore stability and peace. That reminds me, there's a there's a line toward the end of your book where you talk about kind of the the cumulative effect of those constitutional roadblocks have, you know, all but made violent struggle inevitable, right? It's like if, if nonviolent struggle is impossible, you know, that really only leaves one uh, possible alternative. Um, I see in the text uh, in the, the chat board, we've got a question. This came in from a, a couple different folks in different words. Uh, you know, where would we start when designing a new system? I had a number of students, um, you know, ask kind of where they should be sort of directing their political energies. You know, if, if the system is, um, you know, irredeemably broken, uh, you know, what should we tell our students to do? Yeah, I, you know, when you're opening a comment, Alex, you talked about how during the pandemic, we were pretty much on our own. And indeed, uh, one of the things we saw blossom, like mushrooms after a rainstorm in the forest, is what we call mutual aid projects. Uh, I helped start a very simple one in my neighborhood for people who couldn't get out of their house to even go pick up food from a local distributor um, or uh, to have uh, any of their necessities met because stores were shut down and uh, people were, were afraid and told not to go out. Um, mutual aid uh, is a good basis. It can't solve our problems, which are a large scale and has to be done at a very large scale. But mutual aid is kind of a training ground where people help one another. They form a project and they carry that project out together to meet the everyday needs of a group of people or a community. And it's a great training ground for people to learn how they can have power in helping collectively meet the needs of the population. So we see this all the time during a disaster, for example, um, during hurricanes when uh, people will get together and bring their boat and rescue people from rooftops. A lot of those rescues that we see are actually not by the Red Cross or the National Guard. They're actually done by people. They're volunteering. Uh, in New Orleans, after Hurricanes Katrina and Wilma, a little over a decade ago, uh, there were entire medical uh, systems created by people in New Orleans uh, to provide free medical care. And that project actually stayed on, stayed going for a couple of years. So that's, that's one possibility. I think another possibility is to really assert our power to bring this system to a, to a halt because it's the system itself that's allowing us to continue to engage in essentially humanity destroying activities. And we have power that we don't remember we have. And that's in this economic system that we call capitalism. We have power by withdrawing our labor. And if we were able to organize ourselves to not just withdraw our labor, but take over the economic system and reorganize it so it met human needs and met the needs of the entire ecosystem, so it wasn't destructive, we could actually reduce the amount of work that we're doing and continue to produce the necessary basic necessities and to do it at the global level. Um, I think that that's the, really the place where we can start. And one of the exciting things that's happening as labor starts to strike back, as you were talking about, I love that, I love that saying, <laughs> I'm gonna use that some more. Um, that's where we have the power, not just to stop, a destructive system, but to replace it. And I don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell people where to go, where to plug in, except is look at where you work now. If you're students, you're working without being paid. If you have a paying job, think about how you can build power where you already work and to deploy that to help transform uh, the system before it's too late. Yeah, and I will say, I mean, your your, your book, um, you know, it was it was honest. It was a it was a real critique of the system, and there was, um, 
you know, I, it, it left me feeling somewhat pessimistic until I got to your final chapter where you started to sort of provide, um, you know, just some potential action items that people can take. And that I, th I think I sent you a message. I, I got goosebumps as I was reading. I was actually reading it while on jury duty, reading a book about the, sort of the failures of the judicial system. But I, I, I left the book feeling, um, you know, optimistic or ready to get to work. And I think that's kind of what we what we really need here. Um, I saw uh, Mike Honey is on the call and he had a, a well, he had a comment about uh, the current composition of the Supreme Court um, and the kind of the, the fetishization we have with, um, you know, the original intent of the framers. I'm, I'm just curious to know why you think that sort of idea of original intent and the vision of the founders, knowing what we know about them, and I guess maybe part of the problem is we, you know, the average person doesn't know that much about them. Um, but why is it that, you know, we just hold this document in this space in the popular imagination that it's just, you know, it's, it's practically right there with the Ten Commandments in terms of its, you know, binding a historical authority? Well, I, I think it's because of the, the mythology or nationalist mythology that we have been exposed to since we were young children, that the Constitution is kind of like, as I put it to my students, it's kind of like the Ten Commandments that Moses supposedly, and I'm Jewish, that Moses supposedly found in a burning bush. That's unchangeable, right? It's etched into stone, or that Joseph Smith found that etched into a copper plate when he looked into a hole in the ground. But the Constitution isn't something that's written in stone. It didn't come down from above. As Thomas Paine, the, the British skilled worker who joined up with the revolution and later went over to the side of the elites, which I talked about in the book. <laughs> a lot of people don't know that about Thomas Paine. But he defined a constitution as people constituting government. A constitution is just a piece of paper. That's all it is. And it's a design for a system of how to run our society. And because it's written by people and it's on a piece of paper, we can replace it with another piece of paper written, hopefully, by the entire population, uh, by participation with as broad an array of our population as possible. And so we forget that the Constitution is just a piece of paper. I don't know if, if any of you have ever been to D.C., you can go and see a copy of the Constitution in the National Archives. I've done it a couple of times. It's a semicircular room. You stand in line and you walk along this semicircle and you can see a copy of the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and sometimes the Magna Carta. And that's when it really sinks in. This is a piece of paper that's so fragile, they have to keep it in the dark because it's very dark in there because it will fade. Eventually, the ink will fade away and all we'll have left are copies. And, you know, we, if we can ban the copying of music, um, we certainly don't want to run our system based on copies of a document we can't even see anymore. So it's it's I think it's I think it kind of brings us back to Earth to really understand who these framers were. Um, they weren't we the people at the time. There were no women there. There were no free blacks. There were no slaves. There weren't any skilled workers or small merchants. There certainly weren't any farmers. Um, they were all wealthy and they wrote a system that serves them. And. Um, and what motivated me the most to write this book is to just let people know that, to break through the mythology around that. And to go to, to your question about originalism, you know, the way I think about it is um, if we were truly to follow what the framers had intended, um, none of the amendments would be accepted. Remember, most of the first 10 amendments extend rights to people. There were virtually no rights in the articles before the first 10 amendments were ratified. So we wouldn't have any rights. Um, we wouldn't be able to vote. We wouldn't have protections against arbitrary you know, arrest. We wouldn't have any implied right to privacy. We wouldn't have any of that. The other thing that the originalists would have us uh, recognize is that very few people would still have any political power. Essentially, we'd be back to the point where a few thousand people with, significant, with this uh, required amount of property were the only ones who got to vote and to run for office. And the rest of us would, you know, a third of the population were enslaved or indentured. And nearly half the population were women who were considered the equivalent of children by, uh, by the common norms of the time. Um, and if I put myself back in those days, what would my life look like? Well, I would probably be an indentured servant because I actually have, I am in debt. I'm still paying off my student loans. 
So I would, I would be in, in the stocks. Um, and because my father came to the country as an undocumented immigrant, um, I would not have citizenship because we didn't get uh, birthright citizenship um, until the, until the 14th amendment. Um, so, uh, my father would never have become a citizen, which means that I would not be a citizen anymore. And I would, I would be in, in, in essentially in debtor's prison. So when you look back at what the framers original intent was, was this, and that's not the kind of country we would even want today, considering the problems that we face today. We've got a couple more questions on the chat board here. If anybody else has questions, feel free to uh, type them up. Um, there's a longer one that just came in. Uh, speaking on what you said about what happened in Chile with people being manipulated by the elites to vote for a government that doesn't benefit them. What about the people who do not want to learn or are content, that's supposed to be content, to live beneath the elites? Um, and then the uh, person asked the question, says we have people uh, on welfare who stay on welfare, raise generations on welfare. And part of it may be that they think change will never happen for them. Um, but what can we do to inspire them to be part of this labor strikes back idea? Yeah. Well, the, I think the first thing is to find commonalities because regardless of where we might think we are on the political spectrum, Democrat, Republican, Green, Libertarian, member of Democratic Socialists of America or or um, one of those white nationalist militias, we really have shared interests. And when we can identify what those shared interests are, that's when we become powerful and we can change the system. How do we do that? I think we start by looking at the kind of economic system we have. The reality is that virtually everybody has to work. They have to sell their labor for a wage or salary. Some are better paid, some are terribly paid. And many people don't have a job. They can't find one. And many people are so poorly paid, they have more than one job. They have multiple jobs. So how do we, how do we cross the boundaries of race and gender and sex and geography, uh, age, all the things that keep us divided, all the David and Imperia? that Madison and Hamilton talked about. That's what keeps us apart. And our system is designed so that certain interests get met and most other interests do not get met. And it keeps us pitted against each other. And as long as we keep meeting those kinds of divisions and don't see the diversity in our unity, that we are all different, but we're also interconnected. We're not served by a system uh, that we're under. Um, we're not going to be able to change that system. The reality is uh, we can't even change a workplace if we're divided. If we can't get together with the people in our, in our workplace to form a union um, and to speak collectively about what we want changed, those things won't change. They'll just stay terrible. Same thing in a community. If a community can't figure out the points of commonality, um, they're not going to be able to bring about change, whether it's getting better schools or cleaner streets or um, getting the trash picked up or whatever it might be. So, you know, the, one of the main tactics of any movement for change is to find interests, common interests, and to build from that, to start from that. And in Chile, um, my understanding of it is that this constitution had some great ideas it enshrined rights that they didn't have, a lot of economic rights. But the problem was that ultimately um, you're trying to change a system that's still dominated by those with wealth and power and resources. And they can deploy that wealth, power and resources to influence the political process. And so they couldn't stop the constitutional dimension. So that happened, but they could defeat the vote. And so that's one of the risks that we run if we try to go that same route. Oh, hello. Um, yeah, so I, I had a I had a question about a specific um, a specific comment you had about one of the problems with our system is there's too much compromise built in. Um, now our our country is as how would you if we were to rewrite our constitution, how would you create a system 
that allowed every person to have an equal voice in our democratic process, but also deal with this problem of compromise? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, again, I, I, I think that what we need is a hyper democratic alternative. And I hesitate to say, oh, this could be a model because by definition, that would be undemocratic. I would be saying, why don't we do it my way? Um, and I think that the first step really is to have this conversation and to uh, educate one another that the problem that we face is, uh, is based on the rules of the system that doesn't give us the ability to change the system. So that's, that's the starting place. But if I was to have, you know, if somebody said, okay, we're going to, we're going to hand you, you know, the magic wand and um, you're going to imagine the kind of system we would have. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. And, but I would, I would offer alternatives of, of some of the best parts of other kinds of systems. And that could be the, the starting point for a discussion. And I would start, for example, with uh, the way the ancient Athenians did it. You know, of course, it was only the free males that got to do it, but we would have an open assembly where everybody took turns to show up. Um, and the way the Athenians did it was they they had neighborhoods and they had a list of all the adult men, free men, and they each had their turn and they had to show up in the assembly. And if they didn't show up, they would be, you know, the local community would would punish them in whatever way they wanted. And they could bring anything they wanted to the assembly. And that would be a forum for discussing what the problems are. And they would vote on it. And that would be the final say. And there wouldn't be a check on that. And if you didn't like the decision that the assembly had made, then you get involved and you convince enough people to change the decision. Now, that's also the basis of a parliamentary system. So one thing a lot of Americans don't realize is that we don't have the model democratic republic or representative democracy or what we want to call it. Um, very few countries have a system like ours with so many checks in it, so many minority checks, separation of powers and checks and balances. Um, and we also have this other thing I didn't talk about yet called federalism, where the states can block the federal government and the federal government can block the states from taking action. Very few countries have a federal system. Very few countries have checks and very few countries have an open-ended judicial review where the courts can throw out anything that's unconstitutional. So most systems are based on a variation of what's called parliamentary representative democracy. And that's where you vote for parties, the parties that can form a majority form the executive branch. When they no longer have a majority, they don't have the executive branch and you have to have a new election. The courts have almost no judicial review. Some systems have no judicial review at all. So the final word is the parliament. The parliament can only pass bills when there's a majority. There's only a majority because one vote, um, one person, unlike our system, that's not one person, one vote, no matter what we're told, for example, with the Electoral College. Um, in a parliamentary system, because you vote for a party, virtually every array of interests has some representation in the parliament because you need like three or five percent of the vote to get a seat in the parliament. So parties that have shared interests, they come together, they form a government their bills get passed. There's no way for the parliament to block their bill. If their bill gets blocked, the parliament has to dissolve and they have new elections. If their bill passes and people don't like it, they can form a new party and contest for parliament, take over the majority of parliament and change the law. So there are, there's a wide variety of different kinds of governance models. This is not um, inventing it from scratch. And Alex had you had reminded me in my last chapter, I talked about some other existing examples. For example, in Bolivia, where you have neighborhood councils that run themselves and they form into regional councils of the councils. Um, also in Brazil, the landless workers movement uses local democracies. They take over unused land, they build an alternative economic system, they govern themselves, and then they cooperate with other squatted farms. Um, these are some models um, that currently exist that involve hundreds of thousands of people. And what I would encourage folks to do is to explore those different examples and then come up with your own. Great question. Thank you. These are all excellent questions. Thank you, Alan, uh, Andrew, for that. These are fantastic students. Um, and I think uh, you know, one of the things too that that your book does a great job of identifying is, you know, there are 
a number of issues that the American majority has consensus on. Uh, but for whatever reason, you know, the, the the system refuses to recognize that consensus, you know, whether it be surrounding you know, education reform or, you know, proactive climate change, um, you know, initiatives. I think uh, one of the things, just thinking back on your book, you mentioned, and I, I hope you have these numbers handy, but, but just I think at one point you compare uh, the difficulty of amending our Constitution, and, and you describe it as it's sort of less democratic than... Um, you know, kind of the, the slaveocracy of the Confederate Constitution uh, in, in pre-Civil War times. Can you can you explain just kind of how those numbers break down and how, uh, you know, a, an incredibly small portion of the U.S. population can essentially, um, you know, overturn the will of the majority? Yeah, you're putting me on the spot there. I'm trying to remember <laughs> um, what that percentage was, but the the Confederate States Constitution had a lower threshold uh, to amend uh, their Constitution, and, and I'm forgetting at the moment what that is. I want to say it was a simple majority, but I have to look myself. Um, and that's ironic, right? Because we assume, well, you know, they wanted to keep slavery and they broke away and formed their own system of government. Um, they didn't really have a chance to have an election. They never got. They never really got around to it. But they they did model most of their constitution after the one they were they were breaking away from. But they they made it a little bit more democratic, ironically. So it's kind of the irony that elites have democracy, but the rest of us have a republic. I, uh, I, I tra tried it. it down. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I feel like this needs to be heard because it's one of those things where it's like, oh, you know, um, you know, it sounds like it's impossible, but I'm sure, you know, that's hyperbole. Um, but the, you write, the inequality of representation of the states in the Senate means that senators from the 18 smallest states can block passage of an amendment, yeah. even if it passes unanimously in the House, you know, right. the, the more democratic chamber, right? right. Uh, even if it passes the Senate by, uh, even if it passes the Senate, an even smaller number, 13 of the smallest states with a total population of about 15 million people, 4.6% of the U.S. population. Uh, can block the will of nearly the entire U.S. population. Oh yeah, I was I was looking up the percentage for the Confederacy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I understand what you're asking now, and you know it's pretty extraordinary when you think about how the supermajority of the population has a small minority of representation in the Senate. And while we, you know, there are books that are published in recent years and articles that you know the problem is the Senate. We got to get rid of the Senate for that reason. Um, it's not one person, one vote in the Senate. Large population states, um, we have a fraction of the of the vote in the Senate than a small population state. A state with a half a million people has two senators. Our state has 40 million people. We have two senators. Um, that's part of the problem, uh, but it's not the only problem. But to understand the problem of the Senate and that it's protected in the Fifth Amendment, we can't we can't get rid of the Senate. We can't change it to proportional representation, um, it, connecting it to uh, the population because the framers designed it intentionally that way. But the one of the reasons why they designed the Senate that way was to protect property, particularly slave slavery, slaves. Um, they put in place all of these minority checks, the Senate being one of many, to make sure that, say, even if an abolition bill or, or to gradually phase out slavery and you'd have to have a constitutional amendment because it's protected, even though the word slave and slavery are not in the constitution, it's still protected in the constitution. So assuming a constitutional amendment to abolish slavery passes the house, it would never pass the Senate um, because there were at least an equal number of states that had large numbers of slaves and fewer no slaves. Even when the constitution was ratified, most of the slaves we're in what we call the Southern states. So over the next 60 some odd years, every time a state entered the union with a few exceptions, it had and one had it, they entered it two at a time. One is a slave state, one of the free state. And that was due to the 1820 Missouri Compromise. The short of it is that they knew that in the Senate, the inequality of representation would always allow the states with lots of slaves to block any attempt to abolish slavery. 
Now, we hear a lot about the origin of slavery in the Constitution. What we don't really understand is that slavery, except for prisoners, has long been abolished. But they didn't just protect slavery, they protected all forms of property. So the important thing that the way to, to think about how significant this problem is, is imagine for a moment that Bernie Sanders wins the presidency. Now, Bernie Sanders is not the type of socialist who would say, we're going to abolish private property and make the state the owner of all property. He wouldn't do that. But imagine, imagine for a moment that he gets elected. It would be virtually impossible for him to get any bill passed to Congress unless he has a party that supports his initiative and they have supermajorities in both houses. If he didn't, his bills would never pass and they would just wait him out for four years. Now, imagine for a moment, we do get somebody who's more to the left than Bernie Sanders and they win the presidency. And let's say their party controls both houses of Congress and they say, we're, we're getting rid of cap capitalism. We're gonna abolish all private property. We're gonna redistribute it so everybody has an equal share. Imagine the thought experiment for a moment. Well, all you would have to do now is if you don't change the constitution, you can go to the federal courts. And under the fourth, fifth, 14th amendment and other parts of the constitution, you could argue that property is protected against expropriation and we should be paid when you take our property away. Um, and I like to keep this little copy of the constitution with me and I, I encourage my students to have it uh, handy during every class. Um, and if you look at the Fifth Amendment, the last clause in the Fifth Amendment uh, says, uh, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So not only did that protect slavery, so you, state couldn't come in and abolish slavery and say, sorry, sucker, slavery's abolished. We don't have to pay you anything. And we never paid anything because the states where all the slaves were had left the union when um, the 13th Amendment was ratified. So they were out of luck. But it also applies to all other property. Government couldn't just come in and say, we're abolishing capitalism. We're going to move to a post-capitalist system because we would have to compensate all the property owners. So the design of the Senate is part of the design of a system that protects property. And if we are to get past this destructive economic system, we can't do it under the current constitution. And that's a conundrum that we have to face, uh, but it's a reality. And we have 234 years of experience to see how that has worked time and time again. Yeah, I, I was struck by that quote you provided from Madison earlier about the, you know, the rights of property, like the property itself is, is possesses rights, right? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's citizen united, but 200 years earlier, right? Like the idea of corporations being people and having rights. Um, well, I, I see here, we've got about five minutes left. And there was a question about uh, Roe v. Wade and the Dobbs decision. And that's the, the, the reading I had the students uh, do in advance of this presentation was about Roe v. Wade. I'm just kind of curious, um, uh, follow up thoughts on kind of how how that that decision sort of basically confirms everything you've said in your book. <laughs> well, I, I think it's a great question. And um, I wrote a piece that was published in a daily newspaper called the Marin IJ um, that you can find online uh, if you want to look into my thinking about this some more. But it's a good example of how um, not only our system of checks and balances works to advantage the minority, but also how our uh, one of the most important checks and balances is the, the system of federalism. And federalism is something I talk about in the book. I haven't talked about it too much this evening, but federalism is, we understand it as the sharing of power between the federal government and the states. And so the Supreme Court majority um, think of themselves as pro-federalist. In other words, we tend to mistakenly call it states' rights. And so they've lost at every level of uh, the national government. Uh, they can't get an abortion ban passed through Congress as an amendment. They, that was tried. Uh, they've, um, they haven't been able to um, really get They've gotten some bills passed through Congress that limits a woman's access to abortion, particularly for those who are on uh, on Medicaid. Um, and they've banned 
overseas funding of NGOs that provide abortion in, uh, services and information. Um, so their argument this time was that they can't ban it nationwide. And so they flipped their thinking around and they used this minority check called federalism. And they said, well, you know, it's not in the constitution. Uh, there's no enumerated right of women. There's no, in fact, there's no enumerated right of privacy, which is what the original Roe case was hinged on, the implied right to privacy in the Fourth Amendment. So they made a new argument. They said, actually, it should be a power of the states to decide. We're going to kick it down to the states because they knew immediately that a dozen states were going to ban it. They already had those, those activation laws on the books or in one state, what is it, Idaho or Utah, I forget. They've had this on the books for over a century. Um, and so they flipped it around and said, we're gonna let the states decide. And so they, um, rather than coming out and say, there's no national right anymore to an abortion, but by flipping it around and saying, it's actually a state, it's in the state's prerogative to decide, they essentially were using this minority check to say, we know that the majority of the population, even the majority of Republicans do not want uh, row overturned. So we're going to change the way that that right is decided and it'll be decided from state to state. Um, there's another element to it that's also economic. And that is that um, it's the it's really part of the confluence of efforts to try to increase population growth. Uh, in other words, to create a larger population so that the labor force grows as well. Um, in addition to the issues of women having uh, power um, and rights in our constitutional system. So there are different elements to uh, this ruling, but the formal way in which uh, Roe was overturned um, illustrates how one of these minority checks was used. Excellent. Thank you so much. And, and thanks for uh, you know, being so generous with your time tonight and responding to our questions. Um, could not think of a better way to kick this mm -hmm. seminar series off than, uh, than, than with this presentation. Could everyone please join me one final time in uh, thanking Robert Ovetz for Zooming in this evening. That was absolutely fantastic. I highly recommend you check out the book and all of his work. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in and listening. And uh, thank you, Alex uh, and, and Casey, for uh, organizing this and making it happen. It was a real pleasure being able to speak to everybody.